No worries. And uh, Kenji um, did his uh, bachelor's in biology in Occidental College, and then did his PhD work, which I'll talk a little bit about briefly, um, at um, University of Riverside under um, the supervision of Joel Sox. Um, and he came to us uh, via postdoctoral fellowship um, at Chapman University, and he was a fellow in the Grand Challenges Initiative um, in biology there. Um, uh, Kenji's a my, microbial ecologist, um, and he has broad interest in microbial symbioses. Um, and so I was very excited um, to have him come into our department, um, microbiology and molecular genetics, and to recruit him because we have that shared interest in the evolution of cooperation and all these things. And this is a theme that actually sort of weaves throughout not only Kenji's research interests, but through his scholarly activities and outreach. Um, so he thinks about that in his approach to education um, and incorporates it into his teaching and, and mentorship in figuring out ways to make courses more interactive, more collaborative, um, and incorporating that to project and discovery-based education as well. Um, and so we're really excited to have him as an assistant professor of teaching um, here at UC Davis in microbiology and molecular genetics, um, where he's gonna be helping us to make interactive these large courses like microbiology and, and really improve, improve the quality of education. Um, and the other aspect where cooperation and collaboration comes in is that uh, Kenji is uh, very interested and engaged in increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in fact, so much so that he was awarded a, a faculty scholarship as a campus scholar, um, which is how he's presenting here. Um, and so we're really excited that he has that component too. And so um, really excited to have you here and um, look forward to listening a little bit about your research and your, um, and your scholarship. And um, please feel free to type questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring. Um, we'll be saving most of those for the end, except for clarification questions. So with further ado, I give you Dr. Tides. Great, great. Thank you for the feedback. There we go. Thank you for the introduction, Sam. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about experimental evolution of rhizobial symbionts. This is some work that I've been doing since my PhD um, and uh, thinking about ways to kind of continue it here uh, at Davis as part of my um, position as an assistant professor of teaching. So before I get into that, I just wanted to give a Brief background, um, I've been in California my whole life, but in various parts of California. Uh, so I started out in Berkeley. I went to Berkeley High School and I was part of a small school program there. And the name of the small school was Community Partnerships Academy. And one of the big focuses there was giving back to the community. And um, my junior and senior year, I did a lot of work uh, in uh, the local community nearby um, elementary schools and also middle schools and also my high school, the only high school in the city, uh, working with um, students, tutoring, things along those nature. So I built this strong sense of community um, starting at an early age in Berkeley. After that, I traveled down south and I ended up in Los Angeles at Occidental College. And this is where I really started to develop as a scientist. Um, it wasn't until maybe junior year that microbiology really piqued my interest. Before that, I was really more into ecology. But as I started to, to dive into microbiology, I started to learn about these microbial interactions and the fact that I could still study ecology and evolution, but using microbes, which was far faster than using larger organisms. So it was right up my alley, um, kind of a little more instant gratification, if you will. From there, I just moved a little bit east to Riverside, and this is where I started to work on the legume rhizobium symbiosis. And I started out by growing lots and lots of plants, um, lots of legumes, did some greenhouse work, um, but I decided that greenhouses weren't really my favorite, especially when they're 115 degrees in the summer. And not only was I just sweating like crazy, but my plants were starting to die. 
So I transitioned and I started to work within a controlled growth chamber. Um, so I developed a system to grow my plants in this growth chamber. Um, this kind of left image, you have basically plastic shoe boxes with germination pouches inside. So the shoe boxes were a way to, to maintain humidity, but also limit um, mold contamination. And then the growth pouches, those are pretty much plastic bags with a thick cardboard wick or paper wick inside where the plants grow within. Um, on the right, these are magenta boxes, and I'll show you a better picture of that later on. But this whole time that I was working with these legumes, I was really focused on rhizobia. And rhizobia live within these nodules. So you have about one, two, three, six nodules or so right there, one really big pink one, and then several small ones. And the rhizobia are these bacteria that live within it. And I'll give more background later on. But I started getting really into kind of ways to investigate the rhizobia in a really kind of up close and personal way, if you will. So I started to do some microscopy. You have a confocal image that's more art than kind of science, if you will, on the right side, and then actually a cross section. And you might be able to see there's a difference in color. And that difference in color is actually really important for the legume rhizobium symbiosis. That pink is a indicator of really good bacteria and that green is signs of dying um, plant cells and, and the, the symbiosis starting to break down. So I was doing a lot of that work at Riverside, and then I went to Chapman, um, which is in Orange County, and I started to uh, work on project-based learning. So the specific courses that I was teaching, it was uh, I was teaching first and second year students and really trying to get them inspired by the scientific literature. So one of the teams that I'm highlighting here is a team that really got into this idea of algae and what algae can do um, for humans. Uh, in this particular case, it was because it was related to beer. <laughs> uh, whatever works, works. Um, but they were inspired by that paper. And what it led to was um, an eventual board game. But throughout that whole process, there was instructor collaboration. So these students are working in small teams over the course of four semesters. And every semester, they might be interacting with different instructors. So there's myself on the right, and then another instructor on the left. Um, and then two of the five teammates um, that are part of that, um, that algae team. So they were working on developing a board game. Um, and at the end of those two years, they had a poster showcase. Uh, all, all students going through this series end up with this poster showcase for uh, that's open to the public, everybody can see, and even this opportunity to present at external conferences. So not only did this algae team uh, present at an external conference called Play Make Learn, but also this team uh, that developed a CRISPR-Cas9 um, board game. Um, it was kind of like a cross between Operation and Ticket to Ride, if you're familiar with those games. Um, so just some of the things that, that, that I was doing at Chapman, but really kind of, it really shaped and framed the way that I think about education through this project-based learning lens. So that was just, not many months ago, uh, I was I finished up there in uh, May, June or so, and then I traveled back up north to Davis. And what I'm hoping to kind of walk you through through the course of this talk is kind of how each of these four uh, kind of steps in my life have really contributed to what I see myself doing at UC Davis. So I'll get into my talk now and then kind of the, the the bulk of the science and. I want to want to start by talking about mutualisms. Mutualisms are everywhere, um, whether you see them or not. But I think it's important to just start by defining what a mutualistic interaction is or what a mutualism is. And these are interactions between two or more species where both or all partners are benefiting in some way. How you measure that benefit is kind of up to the scientist, and up to the investigator. But some of the more commonly known ones are um, benefits such as services or food. So we have uh, pollination service on the left, we have cleaning service on the right, and in exchange, we're getting food to those um, pollinators and those cleaners. We can also have an exchange of housing for defense. So we have ants that are living within these acacia thorns. We have uh, clownfish that are living within sea anemones. So they're they're given housing, but in, in uh, response, they're providing some sort of defensive uh, mechanism for their home. 
But the mutualisms that I'm really interested in are the microbial mutualisms. So the Human Microbiome Project is something that people are probably very familiar with. And there are many, many mutualisms within the microbiome of humans. Um, but we also might think about some things that are a little more charismatic or a little more kind of one-to-one -one relationships. Um, and this is, this is an example of um, bobtail squid and bioluminescent bacteria, Vibrio fisheri. And um, in either case, uh, the, the, the core benefit that the microbes are provided is housing, but what they are receiving and um, what they are providing to the host uh, could be a sweep of things. It could be increased immune response. It could be some sort of resources. It could be defense. It could be a lot of different things. But one of the big questions in mutualisms is how does one species evolve to benefit the other? And that's a little bit what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is especially in the face of conflict. We don't often think of uh, mutualisms as uh, having conflict, but those resources that are getting exchanged in mutualistic interactions, those are costly to produce or they're costly or energetically costly to, uh, to, to enact the, the behavior associated with them. So mutualisms, um, conflict is predicted within mutualistic interactions as a result of the costly nature that they have. So you might see selection to give less, or you might see selection to extract more of whatever that particular resource might be. In the case of microbial symbioses, we have um, we often see adaptive host control mechanisms. So what we often have in microbial symbioses is many, many microbes associating with one particular host, uh, many individual microbes with one host. So the host can kind of clamp down and, and enact these host control mechanisms that try to minimize some of that conflict. But because the host is outnumbered, these microbial symbionts displace this sort of evolutionary advantage. And this advantage is in terms of population size, which I just mentioned, but also replication rate. These microbes are, are reproducing at a much faster rate within plant tissue, or sorry, host tissue, than um, the host is. This is all within the lifetime of one given host, but you'll have many reproductive cycles um, by the symbiont. And this evolutionary advantage is predicted to subvert many of these host control mechanisms um, that, that we observe in hosts. So when I think about microbial mutualism conflict, I'm really thinking about two kind of areas of questions. I'm thinking about the basic biology, but also the applied biology more recently. And what do I mean by those? When it comes to the basic biology, I'm, I'm really thinking about this mutualism antagonism continuum. So you have benefit benefit on one side, and then you have benefit negative on the other side and everything in between that continuum. And how are these interactions shifting across this mutualism antagonism continuum? I'm also thinking about um, how mutualisms might or mutualists might evolve in a rapidly changing environment. So these uh, microbial mutualists, they have really fast reproduction reproductive rates. And if you have a really rapidly changing environment, how are they able to evolve? And how does that, um, in effect, uh, affect the host that they're interacting with? When it comes to the applied biology, uh, you can kind of take that second basic biology question and, and turn it into an applied question and really think about it in terms of climate change. So climate change is something that's happening, happening very rapidly. So how are these, uh, how is climate change impacting these mutualistic soil microbes? And the work that I do is actually directly related to agriculture. Um, so I'm working a lot with legumes. Um, so how can we use microbial mutualisms for sustainable agricultural practices? And all four of these questions kind of fall under this umbrella question of what environmental context expose hidden conflict in mutualistic interactions? And like I was saying earlier, I address this big question in those kind of four sub questions using the legume rhizobium mutualism, which is a resource exchange mutualism primarily. There is housing involved, but what we have is rhizobia that live within these root nodules, these little spherical um, tumors, root tumors, that fix atmospheric nitrogen, send it over to the plant, and the plant has um, fixed carbon that's uh, photosynthates, it's just producing through photosynthesis, and it's shuttling it down to these root nodules. Um, and part of that uh, shuttling of carbon is to um, 
drive this nitrogen fixation process that is extremely energetically costly, but also to increase the reproductive rate because um, they want to, uh, the, the more rhizobia that are there actively fixing nitrogen, the more uh, benefit they're receiving theoretically. And I'll, I'll give you an example of an exception to that. But how does this interaction actually get started? So rhizobia are soil dwelling bacteria. The legume rhizobia mutualism is facultative, meaning that um, these two uh, partners can actually exist um, separate of each other. They don't always live in contact with each other. So we have these soil dwelling bacteria, and that's what this little kind of rice shaped thing is living in the soil. The legumes are releasing um, exudates from the, the roots, uh, flavonoids in this case, and the rhizobia are attracted to those flavonoids. They make contact with the root surface and then they release a complementary molecule. But what that initiates is this growth of um, tumorous cell growth and this nodule actually forms. So that's what those spheres were. Those, um, those were nodules that were formed um, after the rhizobia were initiated uh, in contact with the, the legume root. And it's not just happening one time, it's happening multiple times on, uh, across the, the plant roots. Once you have those nodules formed, that's when you start to get this exchange of nitrogen and carbon. And then these nodules stick around for weeks, um, depends on the species, but eventually those nodules break down and those rhizobia are released back into the soil and the relationship can start a new cycle with a new set of um, plant roots when they become available. But there is conflict, and this is kind of what I'm interested in, what sources of conflict exist within the legume rhizobium symbiosis. And one of the big ones is reducing the fixed nitrogen provided by rhizobia. So they are providing less of a benefit, but still potentially taking the same amount of benefit back from the plant, same amount of fixed carbon back from the plant. So there are a couple of host control mechanisms I'll talk about. The first one is bias modulation rate. You may have heard this is partner choice. And effectively what this is, is it's blocking ineffective rhizobia from getting into host root tissue before um, they have a chance to extract all these extra resources. So there's some incompatibility and the, the rhizobia can't actually get in. But in some cases, the rhizobia can get in. They're not fixing much nitrogen. And what the host can do is something called host sanctions, where they bias the implant to fitness. And they do this by actually reducing the amount of carbon that they send to the nodules or outright just cutting it off entirely. So now they have no energy source and the um, rhizobia begin to die. Another source of conflict is host overinvestment. So you would think that more rhizobia, more nodules is a good thing, but in fact, I've shown that it's not a good thing. There's an optimum, um, at least in the Lotus Japonicus system. So even when you infect um, Lotus Japonicus with a beneficial symbiont, there's an optimum in the number of nodules formed to attain maximum uh, plant growth. And for us in this experiment, it was right around 20 nodules. The conflict comes into play when you look at the fitness of the rhizobia. So at around 20 nodules, um, the rhizobia are still kind of increasing and their maximum based on this model is actually off the graph, but visually you might say that it's around 30 to 40. Um, but either way, there's this kind of interplay at what is the maximum fitness attained based on the number of nodules formed. So there's another source of conflict at play there when it comes to the number of nodules. And the last uh, source of conflict is one that I've, I've mentioned already, but that the microbes, in this case the rhizobia, have a population size and generation time advantage over the hosts. And just want to emphasize that here. Within one nodule, you could have a million plus rhizobial cells, and you could have dozens of um, nodules on a given plant. So you could potentially have billions of cells for this one given plant. On the bottom left, there's these are a couple of images that I took um, as part of this uh, this article. And this kind of purple staining is a cross section of a nodule. And within that kind of inner layer, that dense purple, those are, those are uh, extremely packed plant cells full of rhizobia. On the left is an electron micrograph, and you can kind of see how densely packed they are, even within a given plant cell. So there's a bunch in there. Um, they have this population size advantage over the, over the legume, the, the rhizobia do. 
So really, this is more of a legume rhizobium symbiosis, not just a mutualism. Um, and that's the way that I think about it, uh, a legume rhizobium symbiosis. And I use this symbiosis to ask the question of what environmental contexts expose hidden conflict and mutualistic interactions. And the way that I go about doing this is uh, experimental evolution. And I've done it in a couple of different ways. The first one involves a clonal rhizobial population with whole genome sequencing, and more recently with um, simple artificial populations. So I'm going to start with this first one, clonal rhizobial, uh, experimental evolution of a clonal rhizobial population. And this is work that I did at UC Riverside um, during my doctorate with the help of um, an amazing team um, of students that kind of helped me for three plus years uh, working on this project. So the rhizobia. I used two different types of rhizobia for this experiment. The first one is Ensifer fredii. And the key here is that the phenotype displayed on Lotus japonicus is the delayed maturation of nodules. So at eight weeks post-infection, um, on the left, top left right here, you have the nodules formed by a uh, beneficial strain, one that we know to be beneficial. They're bright, they're pink, indicative of nitrogen fixation. With NGR234, at eight weeks post-infection, the nodules are still very small and showing very little signs of nitrogen fixation. However, by 20 weeks, these NGR234 nodules are starting to catch up. Um, so we have this delayed maturation phenotype going on with this, this um, strain, NGR234. The other rhizobia is CE3, and the phenotype displayed here is premature senescence. So on the right, we have the, um, the rhizobia that we know to be beneficial. The nodules formed are bright pink, they're fixing, they're active, they're great. On the left, we have signs of senescence, and senescence is when the nodule starts to break down. Usually this is happening um, naturally when the plants are starting to flower and redirect resources, but when we see premature senescence, it's usually a sign of some sort of incompatibility. So we see this happening prematurely at five weeks post-infection with this CE3. But the key point here is that both of these symbionts are mediocre symbionts. So when we do experimental evolution, it gives us a little bit of room to go maybe more towards the um, mutualistic side or more towards the antagonistic side. Um, just a little bit of wiggle room. The other key with these two rhizobia is that they have sequenced genomes, um, which uh, at the time was extremely important. It made our lives a lot easier. It still is, still would make our lives easier, um, but uh, that was a key point in choosing these two, um, these two species. The plants that I use are the host genotypes that I use. I use the wild type MG20 that forms a normal amount of nodules, um, normal, quote unquote. And you can kind of see the individual nodules that have formed. Um, they're kind of sparse. They're, they're uh, distributed throughout the root system. But on the right, we have a hypernodulator. So uh, a genotype that's forming an abundance of nodules. So this is actually a glob of probably 30 nodules, um, all just on one really small root system. And by using this genotype, we're really starting to get into this idea of overinvestment. And is there conflict over overinvestment? Thinking back to um, thinking back to some of those introductory slides. So those are the, the biological materials, but in terms of the methodology for experimental evolution passaging, um, this is kind of how I went about it. So I use that growth pouch method, growth pouch method. I have my seedlings that um, have not been exposed to any bacteria yet. I introduce bacteria that I choose to introduce. I allow them to grow for four weeks. They form nodules. I remove all those nodules after four weeks. I surface sterilize them all, crush them up into a slurry. And then I save some of it for um, whole genome sequencing, accidents, what have you. I also do a little bit of um, serial dilution just to make sure that I have um, enough rhizobia to initiate an interaction. Also as a way to prevent against contamination to see if anything may have gotten in. Um, I could do a little bit of differentiation based on colony morphology. But then, oops, the last um, third went towards inoculating a new set of axonic seedlings. And I did this, um, oops, this is just to give you an idea of what it looked like for three passages. 
it took about 14 weeks for three passages. Um, just, a, just a little schematic to, to give you an idea. And I did this um, for all four combinations with two independent lineages for each combination of um, rhizobia and host genotypes. So I had a total of eight lineages. And I did this for 15 passages. So the passaging alone took about a year and a half. Um, I think I actually started it before my quals um, and then passed my quals and then uh, continued it. And it was like mad dash to do this last portion of the experiment before I defended. Um, and this was comparing the ancestral and derived phenotypes in a greenhouse experiment. So what I was doing here is I was taking um, the original rhizobia and then all the rhizobia that I had evolved over that course, the course of 15 passages on those eight different lineages and was inoculating them clonally um, onto their respective hosts and looking for phenotypic changes um, and symbiosis phenotypic changes. So I had a couple of questions that I was uh, interested in, in addressing. The first was, how does host investment alter Symbion's evolutionary trajectory after repeated interactions with the same host? So we have more nodules, maybe we have more rhizobia in the case of the, the over-investor. So what is, what's going to happen? Maybe adaptive host control is really, really efficient, and any subtle mutations that show up in the rhizobia are going to increase Symbion quality. Or symbionts just evolve an antagonistic phenotype in the absence of any host coevolution. And this is a key point here is that I, it wasn't a coevolution experiment. I wasn't allowing the, um, the legumes to seed and then use those seeds. Um, there are some methodological constraints where I would, wouldn't be able to do that. So I was using um, the same seed set for the entire experiment, which is similar to what you might see in an agricultural setting. And then I was also interested in the genotypes, so doing that uh, whole genome resequencing. So what genotypes evolved? And I'll start with this first part. So I'm only going to show you the data from the CE3-HAR1 combination, which is the premature senescent rhizobia with the overinvesting host. And on these two graphs, you have host fitness on the left and symbiont fitness on the right. And in pink, you have um, the the data from the ancestral population. And then these orange colors, you have um, the data from the um, two derived lineages of this combination, the CE3-HAR1. And what we found is that for host fitness, using shoot biomass as our, our proxy for host fitness, when you compare the derived to the ancestor, we saw an increase, a significantly increased um, shoot biomass. And when you compared the derived to the ancestor, we saw significantly increased shoot biomass. But when you could do those comparisons for symbiont fitness, so the population of the rhizobia within nodules, we saw no difference at all. So what we're thinking is that over the course of these 15 passages, something, some mutations um, occurred and there was some evolution within these derived populations to increase the benefit provided to their hosts. So coming back to this, this first question of, of the, the phenotype that he evolved, the CE3 symbionts provided more benefit on these HAR1 hosts. And I think maybe what was happening is some sort of delayed premature senescence. So they were delaying that premature senescence so they could provide a little bit of nitrogen where we were able to see this little bump in host fitness. But when we extended the experiment out, um, when we looked at the data at a later time point, we saw no differences at all. So eventually that mutualism, those signs of a mutualistic interaction or shift towards mutualism collapsed. So it was only temporary. And it was, uh, it corresponded to our passaging timeline. So um, it was that four week post-infection that we were seeing this increase. So maybe there's some sort of um, selection that I was imposing through my passaging protocol. Maybe, but couldn't be definitive about that. Okay, so moving on to the genotypes. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, some of the, the mutations that, that stood out. Nothing was detectable within the entire population. So what we did is we actually sequenced the genomes of 20 derived isolates to try to see if we can see any kind of lingering or persistent mutations. 
So what these proportions represent is um, eight out of the 20 isolates from replicate A demonstrated the mutation that I'm going to reveal. Three out of 20, zero out of 20, four out of 20, and so on. So we did our sequencing, um, we uh, did our alignment, we looked for mutations, and these are the ones that we found. And I'm gonna highlight a few of them. The first one is this first row, sorbazone dehydrogenase. And we found this in lineage A. There's not much data about what this, um, what sorbazone dehydrogenase could be doing in rhizobia, but maybe it's related to cellular respiration. And given that um, nitrogen fixation is such a, a energetically costly um, uh, reaction, maybe some changes to cellular respiration had something, it's a little hand wavy, um, but it's pretty limited in terms of what's out there in the literature uh, for rhizobia in this gene. The other one that I want to point out is this loss of a plasmid. So when we first looked at this, um, we thought that maybe this was just some weird sequencing error, but we actually went back into previous um, passages. So these are all data from passage 15. But when you look at passage 5 and 10 for lineage B, we actually saw an increase in this genotype where the entire plasmid was lost at around passage 5. So we're pretty confident that this was real. It wasn't just a sequencing error and that there's some interesting dynamic going on associated with this loss of plasmid. And there's a little bit of evidence that this loss of this plasmid, P42F, is related to um, competition, um, competition for nodulation specifically. So it could be some sort of uh, factor going on there. And then the last one that I'm gonna point out is NIFD. And this is a core nitrogen fixation gene. And the reason I'm highlighting it is because it's on P42D, which we know is a symbiotic plasmid. So the vast majority of the symbiosis genes for um, this rhizobia occur on this plasmid, P42D. So um, maybe there are subtle changes to this NIFD complex that um, increase nitrogen fixation, maybe not, but it was something that stood out. So what genotypes evolved during this experiment? Replicate A, we saw serbazone dehydrogenase. Replicate B, we saw the last loss of a plasmid. And then in both, we saw these, uh, this deletion to, to NIFD. So when it comes to experimental evolution of a clonal rhizobial population, the kind of take home point here is phenotypic evolution with evidence of rapid genotype evolution. Okay, so moving on to the second, um, the second type of experimental evolution, and this is with uh, simple artificial populations, and this is work that I was doing at Chapman, um, and I had two undergrads that were working with me pretty much nonstop, even through the, um, through the pandemic as much as we could, Yuvin and Teresa. So for this, I'm using Lotus japonicus um, again but I'm using mesorhizobium loti, and that's the rhizobia that I was showing early on that was this, um, the one that we know to be beneficial. And I was using three different genotypes of mesorhizobium loti. I have the wild type, I have a mediocre symbiont, and an ineffective symbiont. And the way that I know that these, um, the way that I know these phenotypes for these genotypes is I've done an experiment where I clonally inoculate each of these genotypes onto a plant that has received no nitrogen at all. And these are the growth effects that we got. So the wild type, it's growing really big, the mediocre, it's somewhere in between, and then the ineffective, this is actually pretty similar to what would happen if you don't add any rhizobia at all. So the key point here is that the strain should only differ in benefit provided. And if we think about the sanctions hypothesis, strains that provide more benefit are expected to attain greater population size. And this is adaptive host control, um, what I had referenced earlier. So actually biasing in plant fitness. So to conduct my um, experiment evolution of simple artificial populations, I really wanted to make sure that I could track my artificial population. So really track each individual genotype of this mesorhizobium loci. And I did this in two different ways, what I'll call space and time. 
So space is how could I identify these rhizobial genotypes in vitro, but also in vivo. And time is really more that experimental evolution. So how can I track the proportions of the genotypes after serial transfers to new plants? And I'll start with this, this space. How did I track them in space? And the way that I did that was with qPCR. So a quick little rundown of qPCR, a little refresher, if you will. You can imagine you have a segment of double-stranded DNA. You can denature that DNA into two different single strands. You can then adjust the temperature and you get these primers to anneal. You also have some nucleotides in the reaction and some cyber green. And that's what is um, making this a quantitative or the, the Q in qPCR. Once you get that extension, that cyber green locks into place and it starts to fluoresce. And that fluorescence is a signal that we can use to help quantify um, the amount of starting DNA in our sample. And we do this multiple times. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a cycle, a cyclic reaction. And we get many, many copies by the time we've done it 30, 40 times. We can do some math and backtrack and figure out, you know, based on the amount, based on how much um, fluorescence we were getting over time, this is how much DNA we had to start with. But the thing about qPCR is that you need unique target regions. You also need to make sure that you have a known number of copies of that region within your genome um, if you're going to um, do, a, do a, uh, an absolute quantification. For the wild type, it was actually easy because it wasn't truly a wild type. Um, it had DS-RED integrated into the, into the genome. And um, that made it easy because I could just look for qPCR primers for DS-RED and use those. For the mutants, the uh, mediocre and the ineffective symbionts, it was a little more difficult, but it was actually made easy because of the way that the mutants were created. Um, they were created by the insertion of a um, transposon, just a large chunk of DNA, into that gene at a known location. So we were able to use that information, that known insertion point, coupled with the um, sequence genome of our mesorhizobium loci and the sequence of the transposon insertion to create a pair of primers, one for the transposon, one for the flanking genome region that is specific to that mutant. So we did that for both of these, and now we have our primers. So now we can effectively target our unique regions for each of these genotypes um, and, and attempt to use qPCR as a tracking system for these genotypes. So you can imagine we have a, a cell suspension and we've, um, this cell suspension has two of the different genotypes. Maybe it's wild type and the mediocre. We extract our DNA and we load our DNA up into different wells of a 96 well plate to run our qPCR. And for each of those wells, we add primers that are specific to one or the other, the wild type or the, the mediocre. We run our reactions, we do some math and we determine that there are four copies of the wild type and two copies of the mediocre, the STM30, um, in our uh, original sample. So our qPCR estimate of the wild type proportion is um, 0.66, two thirds. But the key here is that we didn't just extract DNA from that cell suspension, we also plated it out. And one of the nice things with DS-RED, for those of you that have worked with it, is DS-RED is visible under natural light. And we we're able to use that colony, colony color to determine the proportion of um, the two different uh, uh, rhizobia in our cell culture. So we we're kind of comparing our qPCR estimates with our CFU estimates. And we we're only able to do that with the wild type and one of the mutants. And that's a key point here that I'll elaborate on later on. Um, because the two mutants, they're both green colored. You can't distinguish them on plates. So we did that for multiple samples, and um, we just ran a simple regression just to see how we were doing estimating um, proportions using our two different methods. And in yellow, you have the combination of the wild type with STM30. In the blue, you have the wild type with STM6, which is the ineffective. And we're seeing pretty good relationships, um, feeling pretty good about the ability of our qPCR data to match our CFU data. So this is in vitro using um, cell cultures that we kind of we we artificially created um, 
using somewhat known uh, initial proportions. But we wanted to do this in a less controlled way. So moving on to in vivo, and eventually the goal was to, to actually extract rhizobia from plant tissue. So the next step was to actually look at individual nodules. So what each of these data points are is an individual nodule. So nodules can get co-infected. You can have two different strains. You can actually have more than two strains within an individual nodule. So what we were interested in doing is you take a nodule and you plate out some of it and you see what bacteria is inside using this color metric assay, but you also extract DNA from that nodule and you run qPCR. So the same um, regression is run, but this time we're doing it with um, a little less control, if you will. So this plot represents close to 200 nodules. Um, and you can't see a lot of the points because a lot of them are actually clustered at the extreme. Um, there is some variation, but it's actually pretty minimal in the grand scheme of things because there's so much stacking over at one and there's so much stacking over at zero. Um, so in this, in these individual nodules, we're still seeing that we can detect uh, fairly well um, co-infection, um, detect the differences between the two different genotypes. And you might notice that there is this really small light dot up here. Um, the, the density of color represents the, um, the population size of the nodule. And um, so like, for example, this one is just a very low population size. So there's probably some, just some sort of sampling error going on. Um, but if you wanted to kind of dig into to this a little more, that's, that's kind of what you're seeing. So that was space. Can we identify proportions of genotypes in space? And um, we come out of that thinking, yes, we can. So this brings us to the time in the, the, the true experiment evolution of the, the artificial populations. So can we track them after serial transfers to new plants? And to do this, um, I use the same passaging protocol as before. Uh, axonic seedlings introduced um, rhizobia, let them grow for four weeks, carry on through the process. But I didn't do 15, I only did three in this case. And um, this allowed me to gather data in a span of you know, 10 to 15 weeks um, instead of a, a year and a half. Um, and what I'm gonna show you here is qPCR data on the left and CFU colony forming unit data on the right. And it's the proportion of the wild type strain that's along the, the vertical axis with the passages along the, the horizontal axis. And earlier I mentioned that I could only do um, the, the CFU comparison when the wild type was involved. So this mediocre and ineffective combination is not gonna appear on the right, it's only gonna appear on the left. And I wanna remind you of the sanctions hypothesis. So rhizobia that fix less nitrogen should receive less carbon. Therefore, the more beneficial rhizobia should be at a greater proportion of the population. So we should see these lines go up because we have the, the wild type that's a uh, proportion that's getting graphed. Or in the case of these blue dots, it's the STM30, um, the mediocre, which is more beneficial than the ineffective. So we should see lines going up. And these horizontal lines just represent the target initial ratios that I was going for, a one to one or 50% and a one to nine or 10%. So after one passage, we saw a sharp increase across the board. After two passages, we still saw um, a little bit of an increase, but they're kind of getting capped by this 100% you know, ceiling, if you will. And by three passages, um, we're seeing a you know, consistent pattern with both qPCR and CFU. So we're both comparing the methods, but we're also using the sanctions hypothesis as a way to kind of verify what we're seeing. You know, we should see an increase. We are in fact seeing an increase. So we're, we're getting more and more confident with this methodology. But the big caveat is what's going on with this STM30 and STM6. We're not seeing a clear increase, at least within these two passages or within these two lineages. Um, they might even be converging back to 50. Who knows? But that's what I wanted to investigate next. So I did that. And I did it using this new, not new, but different growth method. And this is, these are magenta boxes and they're double stacked. So on the top, you have turfus, which is calcined clay or baseball dirt. And on the bottom, you have fertilizer and they're connected using this cotton wick. So fertilizer, sterile fertilizer 
is um, transferred to the calcined clay um, that's providing the moisture for um, for these plants. And I did this just to try to um, get the root architecture to more mimic a wild population instead of growing kind of along this um, this flat surface that they were doing in pouches. So I verified uh, this methodology using the wild type and pretty straightforward. Um, we saw kind of what we expect to see. We saw the wild type increasing. So the magenta boxes are still kind of behaving similarly to the growth pouch methodology. So I then moved on to doing the uh, mediocre with the ineffective combination in these magenta boxes. And I did it with 20 independent lineages, hoping that some sort of pattern might fall out. Are we going to see support for the sanctions hypothesis? Are we going to see some sort of overtaking of um, the ineffective uh, strain because it's uh, reproductive rate is, is that much better than the STM30, whatever it may be. But what we ended up with was a whole lot of nothing. Um, it's pretty much an even split. Uh, I, I want to say it's um, like eight that kind of approach fixation of STM30, seven that approach fixation of STM6, and a lot in between. And um, pretty much any statistics that we tried to do, there's just no patterns that fell out. Um, so this is the data as it is uh, over three passages. Um, some crazy patterns. You might notice that our starting ratios are kind of all over the place in this case. Uh, that was not necessarily on purpose. Um, there were just some issues when it came to creating our initial um, proportion. So if I were to do it again, if we could get more precise with those initial uh, proportions, then maybe we would get um, better data. Um, but so it goes uh, when you're wrapping up a postdoc um, and, and preparing for a new job. So it wasn't just that, I also uh, looked at what happens when you have all three. So because we're using qPCR now, um, I can actually incorporate both mutants with the wild type and, and see kind of what's playing out. And this was a little bit of a proof of concept um, just to see if we could do it. And basically across 10 lineages we did, we saw the wild type take over. But one of the interesting things that starts to fall out is that we're not seeing STM30 kind of consistently better than STM6. The mediocre is not consistently better than ST, uh, the infective. They're both getting hammered. They're both just losing out, essentially. So that might be something worth looking into um, going forward. But the key here is that we have three different genotypes and we're able to effectively track them. So when it comes to artificial populations and tracking over time, I'm feeling good that you know this, this methodology can work um, and it's something that um, I'm hoping to to move on with going forward. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're, we're at four. We're four. Okay, I'm pretty much almost done. Um, so just coming to coming back to these questions, uh, this question: What environmental context exposed hidden conflict in mutualistic interactions? So for the clonal rhizobial population, um, really was using this as a way to address this issue of the the mutualism antagonism continuum. And for simple artificial populations, I really see this as a way to address this question of um, microbial mutualism, evolution, and rapidly changing environments. So we can create these artificial populations, um, thinking about standing genetic variation, and uh, see kind of what happens when we introduce different uh, different factors, whether they're biotic or abiotic. And it should all sound familiar because that's kind of how I how I set this talk up initially. Okay. So in this last little bit, I'm going to kind of quickly run through what I'm hoping to do here at Davis and um, what I've actually already started to develop, which is a course-based undergraduate research experience. And this is kind of a quick schematic of what it looks like. And I'm going to break it down step by step, but this is kind of the, the overview of it all. And before I do that, I'll just briefly define what a cure is, uh, describe the benefits of the cure, and then my working title is the primer cure. Um, I have an acronym. It's cheesy. I'm not going to share it right now, but working on it, working on it. Um, so what is a cure? It's an integration of research and teaching. In my case, it's microbiology, ecology, evolution. But there are five kind of core, um, core aspects of a cure. There's scientific practice, which is pretty normal when it comes to kind of a, a biology lab. Um, there's discovery. So the outcome is actually unknown. What the students are finding in this um, process is unknown. 
that the outcome is relevant to somebody beyond the scope of the course. So the scientific community or any other stakeholders involved. There's a collaborative aspect, but not just among students, but also with the TAs, with the instructors. So everybody's collaborating throughout the whole process. And then there's iteration. So we, as scientists, know that data are messy, and that's part of the process. So there's iteration in terms of collecting more data, but also there's iteration across terms, sharing data with previous or with uh, with future students. Why teach a cure? Some of the things that really stood out for me is one of the things I want to do is, is start to close that opportunity gap and the cures have been um, demonstrated as a, as a way to do so. So one of the things that cures are doing is that they're introducing research um, to students that wouldn't necessarily get a research opportunity um, kind of built into their curriculum. So a cure is building research into the curriculum. It's uh, helping students navigate what this research experience truly is. It's not just a cookbook of follow these instructions and what you get is what you get. Um, there's, there's a scientific nature to them. Uh, there's the more student faculty interaction that's occurring in these cures. And um, this is just something to really emphasize is that it mitigate, mitigates any scheduling conflict that might occur with a cure or with research. So Schedules are hectic, but when it's built into the curriculum, um, students are getting that research experience um, in their courses. The other aspect is ownership. So those last four concepts of a cure, those are um, those have been shown to contribute to student ownership, which has been shown to increase STEM identity, increase retention, increase learning, increase experience, and by nature, all four of these produce research results. So if nothing else, if, you know, for some reason you're not a fan of these, I don't know why you wouldn't be, you're getting research results. Um, and maybe that's important to you. Um, but really, I'm focused on these two. And this is just a happy byproduct for me, the research results. So what is my cure? It's all built on those mesorhizobium low type phenotypes. I showed you two. There are over 6,000 other ones with known insertion points. And uh, one that stands out to me is sorbazone dehydrogenase. Students might have others stand out to them. Part of this cure is picking that mutant. So it starts with mutant choice and it ends with a research goal. My research goal is trying to increase the complexity of these artificial populations. I showed you three. I want to do 50, 100, hundreds, thousands, you know, who knows? I want to do a lot more more than just three and start to figure out kind of what are some of those eco evo dynamics that are going on based on the you know the different uh, standing genetic variation within the population so the first step is ordering that clone that's easy legume based has it available um, easy to track down you then design the primers and it's the same process that i showed you before uh, you have your transposon primer and you have your flanking genome region primer um, i have a step-by-step -step process on how students can assemble um, these new uh, nucleotide sequences and then target specific regions for that primer. They get culturing experience. So they learn how to uh, spread plate, count colonies, streak plate, whatever it may be. They even can start to do some growth rate experiments. They learn how to extract DNA. They do PCR in a gel, but they also do qPCR. And they start to optimize the primers that they have developed. That's part of the whole process is, is kind of whittling down the primers that they've developed into some that are going to be usable for them. That they can eventually use to create a standard curve, which is that kind of background behind the scenes math that I was referencing earlier for qPCR. And then they can get into the in vitro tracking, which is, in a sense, the, the main goal for me. So... I'll breeze through this, but basically I'm confident that my that this flow is hitting on all the fine, kind of five core concepts of a cure. But one of the things that I really like about that workflow is that it doesn't have to be the entire thing. I could just focus on the first two steps, which is actually what I'm going to try to do as a first year seminar. I could also just focus on the latter um, six steps um, and just have a lot of iteration going on when it comes to testing the primers. Or we can branch off and do something completely different. I have history, a history with microscopy. We can do extended experimental evolution, do in vivo tracking. But there's a lot of kind of um, 
there's a lot of adaptability that we can go with uh, for, for this cure. So I'm gonna bring you back to these four questions, um, but really just these two questions. And I'm doing it because this is kind of one of the ways that I am gonna be running my classroom, my lectures in a sense, and asking you to reflect a little bit um, on, on my talk. So these two questions, how do microbial interactions shift across the mutualism antagonism continuum? And how are mutualists evolving in rapidly changing environments? I would like you to think about how those might relate to your research or what you do in your day-to-day -day life and actually contribute to this word cloud. So you can take out your phone, you can scan the QR code, or you can go to menti.com and type in these seven letters and just provide a few words or phrases and I'll pull the word cloud up, um, word cloud up uh, later. And to give you an example of, of kind of how you might adapt this, I'm an assistant professor of teaching. So I'm thinking about pedagogy quite a bit now. So for this first question, I might adapt it and, and say, oh, this reminds me of how I might think about student instructor interactions and how those influence learning. So I would put in student instructor into, into those boxes. Or for that second question, maybe I'm thinking about the classroom environment. So how do instructors adapt to different classroom environments, whether that's the physical environment itself or the size of the class, something that I'm gonna be doing um, pretty soon. And um, so just include some words and, and we'll see what the word cloud pops up, okay? So I'm gonna end there and we'll come back to this, but I just wanna thank um, many, many people at previous institutions and many future collaborators uh, at, at UC Davis. And, and thank you all for, for your time and your attention. And I will happily take questions. <laughs> I'm muted. Are you muted? Uh, okay, thank you very much, Kenji. Um, we actually have a few questions in the chat. Um, um, Titus um, asks, question, the replicates in entirely independent with no cross inoculation, question mark. So that nifty deletion evolved independently into replicates? Yeah, yeah, the lineages were kept entirely independent, and so they got hit with the same clonal population from the start, but then after that initial inoculation, they were entirely kept independent. So um, those new nifty deletions did evolve independently, um, and we, we did track back to the ancestral population. Um, so uh, we know that it wasn't just something with our initial population that occurred, so we, we controlled against that. Fantastic. I think we got a thumbs up from Titus on that one. So that's good. Um, Miriam, Mary Markham, you suggested that cellular so respiration might be increasing, but aren't the nodules depleted of oxygen to protect the nitrogenase? Is there another electron acceptor present? So it's not entirely depleted. It's kept at low enough levels to not interfere with nitrogenase but allow for just enough cellular respiration. So this is actually one of the kind of host control mechanisms that's been thrown out there, kind of controlling the oxygen flux within a nodule. Um, so uh, yeah, so to answer the, the, I guess the first part of the question, um, it's not completely depleted of oxygen. So there is still cellular respiration going on and that's what's providing the rhizobia with enough um, energy to drive the nitrogen fixation process. And then is there another electron acceptor present um, yes, we believe so. Um, what is, uh, flavidoxin has been one that's been thrown out there. It's, it's been found in not, it's, it's a molecule that's similar to flavidoxin. It's been found in other microbes. And we, there was a brief point during my PhD where we got our hands on a rhizobia that had been transformed with flavidoxin molecule or uh, gene. And we're trying to see if it somehow facilitated better or worse um, uh, nitrogen fixation. Um, the reason that experiment didn't, didn't go through is 
it's it's a long story, but we basically got sent E. coli, not rhizobia, because the E. coli developed antibiotic resistance, and it was this huge ordeal. Um, but flavidoxin is something that's found in a different microbe that has been hinted at as something that uh, could be helpful um, in in uh, for rhizobia. All right, I'm gonna add a, a question uh, myself that I was just probably more of a natural history question, but you 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 mentioned the flavonoids that yeah. they attract the rhizobia. Um, is that something that evolved specifically for that purpose, or is there evidence that you know legumes that need you know these mutualists are sort of like fine tuning it or or emitting more at a certain time or right. something like that? Um, so there, there does seem to be a phenology related to it, um, the, the release of flavonoids. But the other aspect is that they are, one, they're pretty specific, um, the types that the, the hosts are releasing and what the different rhizobia are queuing into. Mm -hmm. But it's also not just rhizobia that are responding to those flavonoids. Um, uh, I believe mycorrhizae are also queuing mm -hmm. into them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure plenty of other soil microbes are, are attracted to them. And... Uh, you know, pathogenizing the the roots and not not helping them necessarily. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say something else, else, but it's not related to flavonoids. So, <laughs> go go ahead, Riff. Uh, uh, so the the responding chemical are nod factors, and those are what are released by the rhizobia. So they they receive the the flavonoids, they release nod factors. Those nod factors are also hyper specific. But one of the things that you can do is just drop nod factors directly on roots, legume roots and they'll form nodules. So just the chemical itself will start the nodulation process oh, okay. um, because they're that specific. Oh, so wow. uh, okay. if, if you know people have extracted nod factors from, from uh, rhizobia and just put those on roots and you get a nodule that's full of nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here and so I can pull up a little bit. But uh, there are some more questions. Yes, there's one more question uh, from Titus. I don't know if you can go ahead and open up your uh, microphone there if you want. Yeah, that's what I was. So, so Ken, Ken, now that you've turned off your slides, um, <laughs> I had I had uh, one dumb question, which is just I'm totally unfamiliar with with uh, rhizobial growth conditions, uh, and the question is um, on slide 21. Don't worry about it. It's the CFU counting. Uh, does plate growth bias things, or is are is the are the growth conditions for rhizobial communities pretty in the lab pretty well understood? I'd imagine they are, but I was curious because I know it in other places like soil, it's a huge problem. For rhizobia, it's pretty well understood um, how to grow rhizobia. Um, one of the things that we well, for some there there are different growth rates for different types of rhizobia. There's the the rhizobia, cenorhizobia, mesorhizobia, and brady rhizobia. And those are kind of various growth rates um, that are pretty easy to identify. All the other conditions are um, uh, no problem to, to recreate. But one of the things you do have to be worried about is the production of exopolysaccharides. So during my PhD, we were using um, modified arabinose gluconate, which was this really annoying uh, media to prepare because of all the ingredients and all the you know associated steps. And but what it did is it it prevented the production of these or limited the production of the exopolysaccharides. So you weren't getting these kind of clumped colonies. You actually were truly getting isolated colonies as a result. But it was it was somewhat selective for rhizobia as well that that was helpful. So if you um, were taking a, a nodule from the field that you know definitely has other stuff besides rhizobia, you could um, kind of create these selective growth conditions using those, those mag plates, modified around this glutenate. Um, that was using Brady rhizobia. I'm using mesorhizobia and it doesn't produce as many exopolysaccharides. So now I can just make really simple uh, TY media um, and, and save, uh, save myself from weighing out like 20 other ingredients. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I had, I had one last question if we have time, Sam, good. I think you have to turn your speaker on. Titus said something. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I I muted you, Titus. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, happens a lot for some reason. Never mind. Um, so uh, so on your artificial population slide, the forty four one slide forty four, where you had the the 
the uh, abundance, relative population abundance of different isolates over the different mutants over um, replicates against number of replicates. And you said something like, we, you know, we, uh, our statistical tests didn't show any differences. I don't know if you remember. Um, which slide was it? 20? 44, I think. Oh, 44. Sort of your conclusion, uh, you said something about how, you know, we have some ideas for what to do, but I my postdoc ended, so I didn't get a chance to continue. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that you need to. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, oh, I have yeah, a big box over it. I think it was. Uh, maybe the next. Yeah, this one. So, so I was curious if it seems to me like you know, you can p-hack these things, you know, in a variety of ways, but it, it just seems to me like bimodality itself is actually an outcome of this, mm -hmm. right? And I was curious if you tested for that or if, you know, you didn't have the power to detect it or something, because bimodality would be pretty interesting if, you know, I could make up a story, right? Like there's some stochasticity and if you don't cross a particular threshold, then you're likely to just crash the population right. versus... Anyway, I was just curious. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so the the bimodality aspect of it, um, we didn't test it. No, we didn't get to test it. We one of the things we did struggle with a little bit is how what statistical tests we could actually run on this because each of these are independent lineages. Um, so that's maybe that's a separate question or you know discussion we can have. Um, but kind of the the ecological or evolutionary interplay that's going on here, um, STM30, it is fixing nitrogen, but it's not fixing a lot of nitrogen. So the benefit that it's, re it's receiving is influencing its population growth. So it's actually not growing as fast in planta as the ineffective, I think, because the ineffective isn't fixing any nitrogen. So all the carbon that it's receiving is going directly to reproduction. So is that benefit from that stolen carbon and reproduction greater than the benefit from fixing a little bit of nitrogen and then receiving a little bit of carbon, a little bit more carbon back? So there's that interplay that I, I want to investigate further. And I'm not exactly sure how to design a, a perfect experiment to do that. Um, but uh, there might be you know, some statistical ways to dig into to what I have here. That, that could suggest um, that you know there is this threshold, if you will, and that's something that the the legume rhizobia literature has has tried to investigate, and, and they're really torn on. Like, is it this continuous mechanism of sanctions, or is it this threshold that you have to hit, and once you hit that, then you're gone? Um, and yeah, that's also something that has always intrigued me, but I have never quite known how to approach. Thank you. I, thanks for the talk too. Yeah. All right, I think if there are no more questions, um, I think we can thank Kenji and wrap up there. Um, thank you so much for such an interesting talk and we're really excited to, to have you here.